Hi, this is TJ here at Ryanette, and I'm going to talk you through the basics of Corel here at the 101 DVD. The Corel program is a vector-based program. It's different than Photoshop in the fact that it uses lines and mathematical equations to create and design in. It's also different from Photoshop in the fact that it is actually a design program, where Photoshop is more of an altering program. Some of the basics of Corel I'll show you today, but let's get down to business. When you have Corel, there are some things that you're going to want to do to make your life a lot easier, and that's setting up the workspace. This here is the workspace. This is what you'll be working with. It's currently set to be a letter size. If you want it different, you can change it to any size you want just by either manipulating the words or the sizes here. I like to work in a 12 by 12 box, which is a really good design size for full fronts or full backs. So I like to set my parameters so I know where I am so I'm not too large or too small for an image. Some of the things you want to do for setting up the workspace to begin with is you want to open up your object properties. It makes life a lot easier when you're designing in Corel. That's this project over here. You find it under the Edit tab at the very bottom. You just put a check mark there and it pops up on the right hand side. So the object properties are some of your more simpler tools. This, these are your tools here from your pick tool to your shape, crop, zoom, some of your pen tools. All of these have flyouts with a lot of different choices but we're going to stick to the basics today. These, these four tools here are your color, your outline, your page information, and if you have a URL, you can put the script there. When I type any text, that'll show up over here also. But they're most helpful, and I'll show you later as to why. The other thing you want to make sure that you open up, you'll notice right away that there's a color bar over here. These colors are CMYK colors. If I draw an image on, on the workspace and I fill it with a color just by clicking on one of these over here, you'll see down below that it tells you what color it is and it calls it cyan or red or green. These are the default colors that Corel comes with, but as a screen printer and printing out separations, they don't do you a whole lot of good. They're pretty, but ineffective. To do separations effectively and to have multiple screens, you want to be able to print out in spot colors. So to work in spot colors, we have to work within the Pantone field. And we can bring up a color chart just like this in Pantone right here on the workspace. You'll go to Window, go to Color Palettes, and just put a check mark into next to Pantone Solid Coated, which is the most commonly used Pantone book in our industry. You'll notice it pops up over here next to my CMYK. Every color has a little white dot in it, and that lets me know that I'm working with Pantone. That means it's a solid color. If I draw another square here, and I fill it with a Pantone color, so let's say orange, you'll see I have an orange square and I have a green square. But where they differ is when I go to print out the separations, which Keep in mind, Corel does automatically in the print function, which makes it also different from Photoshop in that manner. I'll go to the print. You can print from several locations. You can print from the printer, or you can choose print under the file menu. The shortcuts are always the easiest to do, and so I always choose the printer itself. It brings up the print dialog box for me here. Notice I have a preview here. It may not open up automatically for you. If not, this is the button here. You just need to press it. It'll open up the print preview. This is where you're going to do most of your work for separations. Under the General tab, you'll always want to choose the printer that you're using. Most of you will be using the Accurip, so you'll just choose your Accurip to your printer. Make sure that your page size under the Properties is correct. I use 13 by 18. It's pretty standard for doing larger prints. Hit OK. Notice now my artwork is in the center of my image. I'll apply that one so that I know that that stays. I don't mind that my artwork is in the center of the page or that it's portrait. That's not a problem. 
Notice the next tab here says separations. This is probably the most important tab as a screen printer for making sure that you have all the colors you need to do your design. Under the separations tab, I'm going to just choose to print the separations. Now there's a whole lot of information down here and you see that I have a lot of options chose. Now because I chose the green box, you notice, remember we pulled it in from the CMYK channel over here, our green box shows up as both cyan and yellow. That doesn't do you a lot of good unless you want to have 13 screens to do four colors. It doesn't help you out. I can uncheck those and eliminate my green box. I had a black, black outline around everything, so the black outline will show up as a single color, and my orange box, because it is a Pantone color, is a solid block of color right there. If I cancel out of this, choose my green box, and choose it as a Pantone color, let's say hexacomb green, and you can always tell what color you chose because you'll find that information in the lower right corner. It also tells me I have a black hairline. I can eliminate that if I don't have any black in my design just by choosing the outline tool and eliminating the outline. I can do that for my orange box block also. And then when I go up to print my separations, going back to the printer function, going to the separations file, you see I only have two colors. I have the green and the orange. Those are considered spot colors and that's what you'll do most of your business with. Now from here you'll see all of this other information here. These are your crop marks and all your pre-press information. And that's the next tab over in the, in the print function, right here. You have a lot of choices here that you can do. If you aren't interested in the color calibration bar or the densometer, you can eliminate those. And if you're not using corner marks or need any crop or fold marks, you can eliminate those. This one here is important because it saves all your file information. It'll print out not only the, the file name, but it'll also print each color as it's shown here on each plate. The registration marks, you have multiple choices. These three choices, you'll be able to see just by choosing it where it places them, most, mostly in the corners. If you like the center marks, that's your choice. You'll notice that we have two issues that came up when we did this. The first one is that the printer marks don't print in the print, fit in the printable area. This is very common to see, especially when you let the print, the print menu do the default on that, but it's very easy to fix. You just need to go down to Print Preview. Now we have our image full blown for us to see, both our green and our orange. And I'm gonna come over here to this tool right here, Marks Placement. By clicking on this, you'll see a red box appears. That's dictating where those marks are. And if I want to bring them on, this, these two seem to be our problem area. I just need to grab that box, bring it in, closer to my image, check both images. I'm still within the print area and I'm good to go. If I want to get back to my print function, I just need to exit out. I can, if I'm comfortable, print directly from here by choosing the printer icon. I'll back myself out, come back to printing the separations, and take a look. Apply my changes, and I'm back down to one issue. I've eliminated that issue. This one tells me I have two or more color separations of printing at the same screen angle. Not an issue. I'm not doing any half tones. So I'm good to go. I can hit print and send it to the printer. Now, as far as Corel goes, there's a lot that you can do within Corel as, as a design program. As I showed you before, we can make many shapes. We've got a rectangle tool, an ellipse tool, and a polygon tool. I even have a basic shapes tool. Any of these toolbars, if I select them, I will get their corresponding information in an upper toolbar up here. And that's what I'm looking at. For basic shapes, there are 14 presets, and here's where they show up. I can have a smiley face by choosing it. I can choose the international don't symbol. 
or I can just choose a triangle if that's what I'm looking for. So a lot of them are pre-drawn out for you so that you can choose them and not have to waste your time trying to figure out how to make those happen. I can even fill them in with color. To do color, there's a couple of ways you can go about it. The easiest way is to choose the color from the, from the Pantone book here and just left click on it and it'll fill the object. You can also come over here to this paint bucket, which is the fill tool, and choose it. Make sure you always go to your palettes and pick a Pantone color. Clicking OK and it'll fill it. Your third option is under your object properties also. You can choose the object, ask it to be filled with a uniform fill or a fountain fill, which we'll get to later, and choose either these colors here are the CMYK colors. I can fill them, but be aware, because it doesn't have the little white dot, it's not a solid color. It's a CMYK color. So now we'll eliminate those. Well, some of the most common things that you'll do in Corel revolve around text. So we'll type in some text here. Once I've typed in my text, I have a lot of freedom of things I want to do to it. To make it larger, I can grab one of the corners. It'll make it larger proportionally. Notice that this image here, this is my image size. It will change as I get bigger or as I get smaller. From the object properties now, because I'm working in text, I can select my text and I can change it any font that I want to at this point right here. I can even treat it as I treat any object and change the color just by choosing a color over in the Pantone list. Keep in mind this is set there are many many colors in Pantone only one row is shown right here but if you come down to the bottom you can scroll through the 700, 800 different Pantone colors that are available. It's helpful if you have a book that corresponds with these, but if not, you can just look for a color that appeals to you. So once I have the text and I've changed the size and the font and the color, I can add an outline, a two-point outline. I can make it a four-point outline. I can even change the color just by choosing one of the CMYK colors or coming to my color selector, going to palettes, and choosing the color I want. I have every Pantone color available to me, and I can just choose one at random. This will give me a two color design, which I can then go to print, go to separations. Notice that I have two colors there. There's my blue outline and my red fill. If I want to make a drop shadow, I'll take away my outline. And Control Z is the undo key. You'll find it under Edit. It's always helpful to learn your shortcut keys. Control Z is probably one of the best ones to have. It'll let you undo anything that you have done and it'll let you back up almost 50 times. I'm going to eliminate that outline right now and be left with just my word. So here, if I want to have a drop shadow, one of the things I can do is duplicate this. Now I can do this a couple of ways. I can come to Edit and go down to Duplicate, or you notice my shortcut key is Control D. So I can use my shortcut key and duplicate the object.
since it's the same color and I don't want that, I'm going to choose the hexachrome black for the outline. Now, to make this behind the text that I have, I need to go to Arrange and pick the order that I want. I want it to the back of the page because I want my red to stand out in front. So I'll just drop it behind the text. And now I have a drop shadow. If I want it to go the other direction, I can choose the red text, move the red text over, and now I have a drop shadow the other direction. It's as simple as that. Some of the other functions, we'll control Z back out of this. Some of the other functions that you can do text-wise is you can fit text to path. I can choose a circle or a line. Let's take an ellipse. We'll make an ellipse. It's got a nice curve to it. I'll take my text and I want to fit my text to that type of curve. I'm not going to necessarily keep the ellipse, but I want my text to, to curve over that to that shape. So what I'll do is I'll draw my ellipse, I'll select my text, and I'm going to go up to my text button up here. I'm going to choose it to fit to path. Notice when I did that, I get this arrow here. It's got a little A with a squiggly line under it and a black arrow. That, whatever I point that on, is the object that I'm going to fit this text to path. Notice as I get closer to the line, the words eventually touch. I can slide it around till I get the red line, which tells me that I'm center on the ellipse, and then I just need to left click. Now my text is part of that. Now I may or not, this is one object at this point, and I may or may not like how those words look, but because I did that, we have another toolbar that popped up here relating just to the fit the text to path. And this gives me some options on how I want the letters to look. I can change them any way I want to get them to sit nice in there. I like that one, so I'll choose that one. Now if I click on the workspace, I don't I deselect anything that's on here. But I want to be able to eliminate that ellipse that I put there. So I'm going to choose the object and I'm going to go to arrange. Here comes another shortcut key. I want to break those two objects apart, which is control K. So I'm going to select that one. If I click on the workspace, I can deselect everything and now just choose my ellipse. I can move it out of the way and delete it, and I'm left with just the text. That I can put over something or under something, doesn't really matter. Some of the other things that you can do in Corel is create envelopes. Now envelopes you see a lot in sports type of design and things like that. So I'll, I'll choose Ryanette again, I'll make it larger, and I want to make it look kind of like a, a bridge that a train would go over. So I'm going to go to Effects, and I'm going to choose my Envelope option. Now it's going to pop up on the right here. I didn't lose my object property, just drop back behind it. So now that I've chosen, go back to my Pick Tool, now that I've chosen my text and I want to do an envelope on it, I'm just going to add a new envelope. Notice I have a different square around my text now. Each one of these little blue squares is a node, and I'm able to move those nodes however I want. So, I, so be aware that you're going to manipulate the text this way. If I want this to be larger, I can drop this down. I can take this one and bring it down. And I've already started to create that arch. If I don't want it to be that big, I can just drop the tops then also. These arrows also play a factor. If I want them to be nice and even with the line, I just grab the tip of the arrow. Hmm. We'll back out of that. Here we go. We'll bring our middle node down first, then bring our top node down and bring our arrow on, even it out with the line. So you get a nice even line. Same thing with the bottoms. It'll bring those up nice and even with the text. So I can get an arch or I can drop out. But any of these nodes, as I move them, are going to do anything I want with the text. So I have a lot of freedom 
to move this around, you see. So that's something you can play with with the envelopes. There are other programs that allow you to manipulate this faster and easier if necessary. Now, getting away from text and getting into shapes, the Corel functions, some of the newer functions in X3, have a lot of fun design possibilities. If I take an ellipse, say this size, and I want to create a moon, I'm going to use the Smart Fill function, which is this one right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw that ellipse, I'm going to use my shortcut key, Control D, and I'm going to duplicate it. Now I have two of them. So now I'm going to create, this is the shape that I want. I want this crescent moon. Well, I don't want to fill either of these and get myself all messed up. So I'm going to come up here to my Smart Fill, and I'm going to select the Smart Fill function. Again, another toolbar pops up up here. Now I'm telling it, I'm going to specify where I want it to go. I don't want to use the default. I want to make the choice. I can choose any color I want, but because I'm going making it a moon, I'm going to choose yellow, and I'm going to choose to have a one-point outline, not a four, as a black. Now notice my cursor is no longer an arrow, but it's a cross. Wherever I put that cross is what I'm going to fill. I have three choices here with this overlap, and I'm going to choose the moon. So I'm going to click right in the middle of it. Notice just the moon filled in. So now I'm going to go back up to my pick tool, which is the most important tool up here so that you can manipulate anything on the workspace. I can go over, drag my moon out, and now I just have a moon. I can choose by drawing a box around the other images to delete them, and I'm left with just the moon. And that's a lot easier than trying to take a circle and cut out part of it and manipulate it to get the exact perfect roundness that you're looking for. If I'm looking for a nightscape, I can then come over to my polygon tool, to the flyout, choose the star option, and draw in a bunch of stars here and around, and I have an instant nightscape. Pretty simple. Some of the other options that we have, as far as coloring goes, I'm going to go back to my object properties. One of the things you will find that you use a lot of, and part of the reason you'll have AccuRip or any of the PostScript printers, is because you're going to use a fountain fill. So I'm going to fill this with a fountain fill. And all a fountain fill in Corel is, is a set of half tones. It's going to go from 100%, what we have here, down to zero. I'm taking this from a black to a white. So as I, as I come in on this, you can see the percentage of color starts to, to downgrade there. I have a lot of options with the fountain fill, and the advanced feature on it has a lot that you can play with. I can choose a left to right, I can have a radial fill, a square fill, or a starburst fill. I can also have control over the color I want. By going here and choosing a different color, I can change the design. I'm going to go from a dark green to a light green. I even have the option under the advanced feature, when I put my cursor over the view square, I can manipulate and change how I want that fountain fill to look. In fact, I don't even have to go to that. I can do that. Notice the cursor turns to a cross right here in this option and make instantaneous changes for how I want that fountain to look. And this is just, these are just half tones that you'll use to create lots of different colors with one color screen. I go from a dark green all the way almost into a teal, up into a, almost a light, really light green color, all within just using one color in one screen. So now, what else can Corel do? You know, in Photoshop, you can bring in pictures, you can do different objects, things like that. You can do that in Corel Draw also. 
even though Corel does have its own photo manipulator called Photo Paint, which under the rocket you can find right there. Take images over to it, manipulate them there. But within Draw, it's pretty easy to manipulate those same type of objects. Let's take this image for example. This image here is a Spitfire head. What this is taken straight off the internet. I won't be using it for any other purposes. I do not suggest that you take any images off the internet for your own purpose. But for demonstration, I'll be using it. This image here looks as though it could be a draw image. But when I click on it, I can't really manipulate anything. And I see this gray box as I start to move it. If I go to view and I look at it in wireframe, keeping in mind that vector works in wires, I see all this gray material here. That tells me that this is a bitmap or a JPEG, and it's working in raster image. I can't do anything as a vector image to manipulate this until I make it a vector image. Can I do that in draw? Yeah, I can. So now I'm going to go back and so I can look at it in color and say I want to be able to manipulate this and make this Spitfire blue rather than red. Well, the first thing I have to do is go up to my bitmaps tab. And the trace function is one you'll get familiar with, especially if you have images that come in that you scan in, which automatically make them a bitmap, or you bring in images that are not specifically already vectorized. There's many choices to do the trace. I always like to start with the first one and work myself through it. By choosing that, I bring up the before and after of the trace function. This is the image before. We see a lot of stray dots here and around. And it's kind of fuzzy. But when I go to vector, I lose some of the fuzziness because now I work in lines rather than dots. So under the line art, I get a real nice clean image as far as I can tell. It tells me it's three colors and it's still RGB. But working for the industry that we do, we definitely want it to be spot color. So before I even say, OK, I'm going to go down and make the program make it a spot color. If I like what I have, I'm going to ask it to delete the original image so that I don't get caught up with too many images on my thing, on my workspace. And I'm going to have it eliminate the background because I don't need all of this extra stuff here. I'm just working with the image itself. So when I hit OK, now I'm left with a vector image. I can go back up to my View tab and take a look at it in wireframe. Now I have my lines. I'll go back to Enhance with Overprints. This allows me to enlarge it or minimize it or do whatever I want to do with it and never lose the integrity of the design. Whereas with a raster image that comes in pixels, those pixels have a finite amount of information that only allows you to let them be as big as your original image coming in. By stretching them, you distort the image. So here, I want to be able to manipulate it. First thing I have to do, it's a group of images. So I want to go up, and I want to ungroup it. Notice all these little dots. Those are nodes telling me those are all individual images. And that's probably where I'm going to find most of my white images. The Objects Properties comes in very handy here, because when I select an image, it tells me what color I've selected. If I'm going to do this, I can just eliminate the white because I just want to change the red. So I'll just delete out the white, but knowing I need to look for it in multiple locations. I also notice when I zoom in here that I have a strange little color here. What happens in the trace is that the program saw pixels there, but they didn't associate them to be part of this and assign them a different color value. At this point, I can just eliminate that and keep the integrity of my design. Now, if I want my guy to be blue, I can just choose the red, go over, and select blue. Notice it was just the outline, because I only chose that object. It's an independent object. I'll have to go through the entire design and select the color I want for each individual piece. You can do this one at a time. Or you can hold down the Shift key as you're choosing and select each object on its own and then change the color. 
That's how you turn raster images into vector images so that you can manipulate them effectively. What else can you do with raster images? Well, let's bring in another one. I want to bring in an image, so I'm going to say I'm going to import the image in. Let's bring in a five gallon pail. That's a good one to have. Now this is an image that looks like a photograph because it is, but I want to be able to do some other things with it. I'm going to add text and I'm going to change part of it because I only want to have part of it in there. So what I can do is I can choose this image and if I only want to see a little bit of it, I can go ahead, draw a square, put the square off to the side. Say I only want to see that much of this image. I can have my square here, choose, go back up to my pick tool, choose this image and I want to put this image inside that square. So I'm going to go up to effects and go to power clip. Now I want to place that inside my container. Notice I get a really big fat black pointer. I'm going to put that right in the container I want it to be and I'm going to left click. Now I've placed that image inside that container. This works great if you're doing photographs. You can bring in a photograph. If it, most photographs are square, you can draw an, a circle or an ellipse and bring the photograph right into there, eliminating the excess around the outside. It's not even there anymore. You don't have to worry about it. It's not a mask as if you were doing it in Photoshop. You can do the same thing, but you have to create a new channel and do a mask to hide that excess information. This way, it just puts the information all contained inside there. I can add my text at this point. We'll call it a CB and just put it in the corner. And now it's ready to go. This type of manipulation within Draw is really effective if you want to add vector images to current JPEG or bitmap images for digital printing, such as sublimation or chromoblast and those types of items. So I think you've noticed up in the corner here, I have all these other tools I haven't addressed. Well, those tools are for a, another program called Smart Designer. And Smart Designer is a plugin for Corel. And as new Corel users, it's a very, very effective program for making artwork simple and quick. What Smart Designer did is took a lot of those things that I just showed you how to do in Corel and made them one button pushes. So you can do circle text, you can do swapping document colors, you can do the text effects, all of those things you can do with one button pushes. I'll give you an example here. We'll go back to our Ryanet logo. And if I want to do some text effects, I just go to Smart Designer and ask it. Do I want to do a drop shadow? Sure. I ask it to do the drop shadow and apply. Notice it does it automatically. I didn't have to do any work to it at all. There are also preset effects. I can add, these are great for digital users. You can add these preset effects all the way around the design and then print it out. The envelopes that we did before, I can do automatically here just by choosing one of these envelopes. Let me select this and we'll choose to arch it the way we did before. It gives you a lot of freedom to do what you need to do. Even though you apply an effect, it does not mean you do not have control on the workspace. Once you say OK, you can do whatever it is you need to do. You can also have drop shadows, those types of backgrounds. You can add texture. You can add patterns. You can add lots of patterns. But one of the things I like most about Smart Designer, well, one of the many things I like most about it, is its template features. 
I can bring in a template. Let me eliminate. Let's see here. Let's bring in a sports template. Like the Knights. Say I like the basketball player. We'll, we'll get rid of our text effects here. I can bring in this image sitting with a client and know that this is not who they are, but they like the basketball player and the basketball. With the design property editor that comes with Smart Designer, all I have to do is type in what, what I want it to be. I can type in Vancouver, hit enter. It makes the change automatically for me. If I know that they're not the Knights, but they're the Trappers, I can also change that. It does the artwork for me automatically, making life a lot faster and simpler for me, especially if you're targeting schools, sports programs, anything like that. Clip art is pretty standard when it gets into sports teams, so you just need to find their logo and make the appropriate changes. Saves you a lot of time in your art room, saves you a lot of time in general. Because where do you want to spend your time, printing or doing art? You get paid to print, you don't really get paid to do art. Some of the other functions that this can do then is this function here. The product blanks is one of my favorite things as Smart Designer. If I'm sitting with a customer and they have their logo, but they can't really visualize what shirt that they're, what shirt colors work best for them, I can bring in a t-shirt from the product blanks, put it behind the image, get it nice and centered up there, and then I can choose the shirt, go over to my color, and show them what their design looks like on all the different color shirts that they want. It makes it really easy to do this, and you can do it right in front of the customer and show them exactly what it is that they're looking for. If they have a specific shirt line in mind under product blanks, there's already preset colors for a lot of the different shirt companies. So if they're using a Russell shirt, you can choose Russell's red or their gray or their blue or even their yellow, and it'll match the shirt color from the company itself. It makes proofing very easy, very productive in the least amount of time. The other, there are many other features that come with Smart Designer. I'll just show you a few more. Athletic Tales is one of the hardest things to create. The Smart Designer, they went and made it pretty easy. They give you a lot to choose from, and these come with Smart Designer itself. It is not a, anything you have to add on. They come part of the program. And you just choose the one you want. Just type it into the design editor and hit apply. It'll bring it right into the workspace for me to look at. Make sure that I have it in the color I want. And now I can manipulate it from here. Makes it that simple. I'll drag it down so it fits on my fits on my page, and I'm ready to print. It's that easy. Well, that's about all there is to show you for some of the fun features. Smart Designer has a lot more to explore. It's definitely worth looking into. But have fun, like with any other art program. It can take you a long time to learn them. Corel, luckily being the one with the shortest learning curve and the funnest way to go about it. So play with the tools, see what they can do for you, and enjoy. You've got a great new program.